You don't have to jog, that's okay. <laughs> All right, those of you who are in the hall, we're going to get started. I have no idea if that was 10 minutes or not, I'm not going to lie. I said 10 minutes and then I didn't even know what time it was, so. All right. Most of you will know our next speaker, Pastor Mike Summers. He's the founding pastor here at Countryside. He's our lead teaching pastor, and to me, he's like my holy big brother. So I've known him for most of my adult life and have learned almost everything that I know about life and godliness from my pastor, Mike Summers. So I really appreciate him. He comes to us with a wealth of knowledge and decades of counseling experience with both men and women. We're privileged to have him as our shepherd here. And we look forward to hearing what you share with us now. So thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you, Dory. I told someone when I came in here, like, wow, there is way too much estrogen in this room for me. <laughs> it's good to have you ladies with us. And um, I'm actually very excited about um, our time together in this session um, appreciated JD's uh, laying such a, a good foundation for what we're going to be looking at um, now at this in this hour. Uh, emotions are uh, wonderful gifts from God, aren't they? I mean, who doesn't like to feel joyful, to feel uh, excited, to feel peaceful? Uh, or to feel those warm feelings of love. Uh, what a great gift from God. But there's other emotions that don't feel so wonderful. Uh, I don't really like to feel frustrated. I don't like to feel fearful. I don't like to feel angry. I don't like to feel embarrassed. I don't like to feel disappointed. I don't like to feel wounded or grieved, and I don't like to feel anxious. Do you? But whatever negative emotions we experience, these emotions communicate something to us. They tell us that something is going on within our hearts. That's why God gave us the capacity to feel emotions, even negative emotions. He designed emotions to be like reports that tell us where our heart is at any given moment. So our emotions, as J.D. mentioned, are not guides that are to direct us. They are gauges that reveal what's in our heart. The Bible uses a lot of words to refer to that inner you. It uses words like mind and will, and spirit, and soul. But all of these words are summed up by the word heart. When the Bible uses the word heart, it refers to that part of the inner you that reasons, that thinks, that feels, that desires. And because of that, heart issues are the real issues of life because your heart, my heart, reveals the real you. Proverbs 27, 19 says, and it gives a picture here. It says, as in water, face reflects face. In other words, you look in a pool of water, you see someone looking back at you. So the heart of man or woman reflects the man. Your emotions reflect what's going on in you. So your heart, that is what you feel, what you think, what you desire, reveal you. Because the real issues in life are not those things who, that happen to us. They are those things that happen in us. And so what is happening in our hearts is expressed through our emotions it's common today to hear someone give this advice. Oh, honey, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. You think, really? 
That is actually one of the worst things you could do because, as J.D. mentioned, the heart is deceitful. Scripture never tells us to follow our hearts. It tells us to, to guide our hearts and to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance. Be vigilant about guarding your heart. Proverbs 23.19 says, Direct your heart in the way. In other words, guide your heart. Look ahead to see where you need to be going and guide your heart that way. Don't listen to your heart. If you have a Bible with you, I want you to go ahead and turn to Matthew uh, chapter 6. Uh, I thought about just doing a topical uh, message and dealing with all these issues, but Jesus did that for us, and so it's actually kind of fun just to go through Scripture and see what He has to say about it. So I'm going to use the balance of our time together in the session to look at an emotion that we all experience, the emotion of anxiety. And then I want to consider what Jesus says about it. How many of you have ever felt that sense of unease or nervousness or apprehension about something that you have to do? Yeah. Um, how many of you have felt that feeling of worry or foreboding or even panic about an uncertain outcome? These are things that we all experience. But people have varying degrees of anxiety. Um, parents tend to worry about their kids. Dads are anxious about their jobs. Moms are anxious about the family finances. Singles are worried about their future. These are your everyday garden variety kinds of worries or concerns. But anxiety can show up in some ways that can actually become crippling and that can prevent us from moving forward. Uh, there are those who experience these debilitating panic attacks. There are those who experience intrusive, obsessive thoughts that lead to extreme compulsive behaviors. So the emotion of anxiety is something that can affect people in, in varying degrees. So we need to understand why anxiety is expressed in our hearts. David cried out in Psalm 139, 23. Listen to what he says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Did you know the word thoughts here refers to inner worries or anxieties? In fact, the New American Standard Bible translates it as my anxious thoughts. Know my anxious thoughts, Lord. So we need to understand why we have these anxious thoughts, because what they do is they weigh us down, they push us down, they press in on us. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. It's a big deal. This pressure leads to a loss of perspective. Think about the last time that you are really anxious. You lose sight of, of what's really happening because what is dominant in your mind is some other outcome that you get fixated on. You lose perspective of God. Anxiety reveals that we're looking to something other than God to provide what we think we need. You see, when we take things that are, are good, things like children or, or marriage or comfort or security or friends, or beauty, or health. And then we look to these things to provide us something, to provide us what only God can provide. Then these things actually become idols in our lives. And it's these God replacements that affect our thoughts and our emotions and ultimately affect our actions. So it's important that we understand anxiety, that we understand how this emotion affects us and what to do about it. Now in Matthew 6, verses 23 through 34, Jesus addresses this subject. In fact, he uses the word anxious five times in this section. And three of those times, Jesus specifically says, do not be anxious. Now there's two main things about anxiety that I want us to consider from Jesus' instruction here. We're going to consider what anxiety exposes and then how we are to deal with it. So first, consider from Jesus' teaching 
what the presence of anxiety exposes. What the presence of anxiety exposes. This is in verses 24 through 30. Now in these verses, Jesus says that the presence of anxiety actually exposes three things about us. What are they? Well, first, the presence of anxiety exposes wrong priorities. When you're anxious, it is actually an indication of a much, much bigger issue. You see, often the reason that you feel anxious is because you're preoccupied with the wrong thing. You see, when we think that anything other than God will provide us security or fulfillment, then that is what we're going to seek. And Jesus says that is what anxiety reveals. Notice he says that anxiety reveals we have divided loyalties. Anxiety reveals we have divided loyalties. We see this in verse 24. Follow along. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now anything that we put before God becomes an idol of the heart that we devote ourselves to. It becomes sort of a a protected thing to us. And when that thing becomes threatened, the result is we become anxious. Think about some of the things that you've been anxious about. Usually it's about something that we are afraid to lose. It might be Losing control of something or losing our health or losing a relationship or losing a job or losing something that makes us feel secure. And these things that we are afraid of losing are the things that we give ourselves over to serve. You see, Jesus tells us that whatever we value the most is what we are going to serve. And that's the issue. We don't have the capacity to serve two masters. You see, if, if we exalt personal security, then we become a, a slave to whatever we think will make us feel secure. And when something then threatens that security, we become anxious. If we exalt our, our health, then what happens is we can become a slave to our health, and when something threatens that health, then we become anxious. Now, the fundamental problem with becoming devoted to those kinds of things is that what it does is it relegates God to second place. So when you're anxious, Jesus tells us, it reveals you have divided loyalties. But anxiety reveals something else. In verse 25, we see that anxiety reveals we have distorted concerns. We have distorted concerns. If you have divided loyalties, it's only natural that you're going to have divided or distorted concerns. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? See, Jesus essentially is saying here that your anxiety is the result of being concerned about the wrong things. You see, you think life is all about what you need physically. But your life is much more than what you eat or what you drink or what you put on the body. Jesus says, therefore, stop being anxious about your life materially. When was the last time that you were anxious about food or drink or clothing? My guess is probably never. The basic necessities of life are really not the kinds of concerns that people in Johnson County, Kansas have. It's not the kind of things we tend to worry about. We've got more food than we could ever consume. And we've got more clothes than we could ever wear. So the things that we tend to be anxious about really aren't the basic needs of life. But I think what this means is that what Jesus says here is a really strong indictment on those of us who get anxious about life's non-essentials, isn't it? 
Jesus' point is that life is so much more than the material stuff of this life. When we're anxious, it only reveals that the concerns of our heart are distorted. We've taken small things and we've made them big things. Then in verses 26 through 30, Jesus says there's something else anxiety does. The presence of anxiety exposes a wrong perspective. It exposes a wrong perspective. See, one of the problems with anxiety is that it consumes all our attention. It sort of just sucks it, you know, right to whatever it is that we're concerned about. It prevents us from looking at life through the lens of truth. So how does anxiety reveal that we have a skewed perspective? Well, in verse 26, Jesus says that anxiety blinds you to the Father's loving care. Anxiety keeps you from seeing God for who he is. Jesus says, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? See, Jesus uses an object lesson from nature to prove his point. He takes birds. So you have birds, they're picking seeds, they're picking incense, uh, insects, they're picking berries off the ground. And as they're doing that, they're actually being fed by God through these God-given instincts. Your Heavenly Father feeds them. And in the same way, Jesus says, God cares for you. He provides for us through our God-given instruction to work. But here's what happens. When we become anxious, the focus shifts from God to our circumstances. Things are getting really tight financially in the economy. We're headed toward some really dark days. People start to panic. Oh man, look what's happening. Look, what's, look what the Fed is doing. Look what's happening to our savings. Look at inflation, how high it is. We take our focus off of God. So we begin to doubt God's love. We begin to doubt God's care. We begin to doubt God's faithfulness. And in this way, anxiety blinds us to God's character. You see, no bird was ever created in God's image, but you were. Jesus didn't die for any bird, but he died for you. No bird was ever designed to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ, but if you're saved, you are. So if God sustains the life of a bird, why would you be anxious over God's care for you? That's what Jesus is saying. Anxiety keeps you from seeing that you're valued by God. How many of you know that when you become anxious that you actually are consumed by that feeling of anxiety, right? Anxiety keeps you from seeing in that moment that you're valued by God. But notice that it not only blinds you to the Father's loving care, secondly, it blinds you to the Father's sovereign control. It blinds you to His sovereign control. Look at the next verse, verse 27. Jesus asked the question, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? See, anxiety is that emotion that we feel when we're unable to control something that we think is ours to control. But Jesus' illustration shows that we are powerless over life. God is the only one who is over the day of our birth, the day of our death, and every day in between. So it's pointless to try to control the things that only God controls. See, what happens when we become anxious, we become blind to the fact of God's sovereign control over our life. So fundamentally, at the root of anxiety is a failure to embrace and accept that we have a sovereign God who does whatever He determines is right. And when we're anxious, we can't see that. Are you going to change your health by worrying about it? Are you going to change your financial situation by worrying about it? Are you going to change how people perceive you by worrying about it? No. We know the answer to all those questions is no. Worry doesn't change anything. 
So what we need to do is to look to the God of heaven who's sovereign over every aspect of our lives and trust in him. So anxiety blinds us to the Father's loving care, to his sovereign control, and thirdly, to the Father's good purpose. It blinds us to our Father's good purpose. Now in verses 28 through 30, Jesus changes illustrations or metaphors and he points to the flowers that were on the Galilean hillside to amplify, amplify everything that he's been saying. Here's what he says. He asks the question, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So flowers are part of God's beautiful creation. The genetic makeup that God assigned to them reflects his glorious design. I mean, they're incredible if you ever look at the various parts of a flower under a microscope. They're beautiful even without a microscope. Right? They reflect God's design. There's order, there's symmetry, there's beauty. But these same flowers, Jesus says, that are more glorious in their beauty than even Solomon They were gathered up by women and used as fuel in their baking ovens. They would take these flowers from the Galilean hillside when they were dry and they would use them as fuel to bake bread. So what's Jesus' point? It's this, that if God has taken such care to provide so gloriously for what is used as fuel to bake bread, then how much more will he take care of you who are here for a far greater purpose? You see, whenever we are anxious and we give in to emotions of anxiety, we fail to see that God actually has a good purpose for our lives. We fail to see that God wants us to reflect his glory in everything that we experience in life. And so we get anxious when we can't control that cancer diagnosis. We become anxious when we can't control how our bodies change as we age. You see, we fail to see that God wants us to glorify Him in our circumstances, whether that is cancer or age. Why don't we see these things? I really believe it's because of what we are trusting or believing when we are anxious. Jesus tells us here that it is a faith issue That's why in verse 29 he said, O you of little faith. See, anxiety reveals that you're not trusting that God has a glorious purpose for whatever it is that you're going through. Now Jesus, nor am I, denying the fact that we go through things that are really, really hard. Go through some things that are painful. We experience things in life, circumstances in life, that are crises. And yet, During those times, are we trusting God or are we focused on those circumstances and letting anxiety consume us? It's amazing to me how we can believe that God was able to break the shackles of Satan, that he could rescue us from hell, that he could grant us eternal life. We just don't believe he's able to get us through the next few days. You see, what anxiety does is it just strikes a blow at the character of God. At the root of anxiety is a blatant distrust of God's love and power. In essence, anxiety screams to us, God cannot be trusted. How many of you have felt that? I have. I don't know. I need to, you know, it makes sense. God has also given us a brain and, you know, we are to handle these things and make it happen. But God can be trusted. And that's what Jesus is saying here. On the back of your notes are some diagnostic questions that you can ask yourselves when you're feeling anxious. We're not going to go through these now. But sometime this week, go through those. And I put it, everything on the back of your notes is actually there intended as a supplement for you. So we're not going to go any, over any of that stuff. That's kind of free. Well, I guess the whole seminar is free. So that's free too. All right. So we've considered what Jesus said 
that anxiety exposes. But what are we to do when we find ourselves selves being anxious? Well, Jesus tells us in verses 31 through 34. Because here we see how to deal with being anxious. How to deal with being anxious. So how do we do that? Well, first in verses 31 and 32, Jesus shows that we are to trust God exclusively as the one who knows your needs. Trust God exclusively as the one who knows your needs. So here's what he says. Therefore, now he's bringing things to a conclusion. Do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So Jesus is saying here, stop being anxious over the stuff that, that you think you need in order to be secure. When you do that, you're only acting like an unbeliever who has no faith in God at all. This is what he's saying. Listen, you have a God who can be trusted. He knows everything that you truly need. And if there's something you need, God is going to see to that need. So rather than being consumed with our needs, which is what we do when we're anxious, we need to be consumed with God. If anxiety is an expression of faithlessness, then the way to deal with anxiety is to intentionally trust God for your needs. So, Jesus says, trust God exclusively as the one who knows your needs. And second, when you're anxious, seek God preeminently as the one who is what you need. See, Jesus said in verse 32 that what we're not to seek. And then in verse 33, he tells us what we are to seek. Look at this verse. He says, but, there's the contrast, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what things? Well, the things that were just mentioned that you worry about. All these things will be added to you. So Jesus is saying rather than pursue the things we think will give us security or happiness, we need to seek God. Because when we seek God, we find him. And when we find him, we have all we need. See, when you set your desires on Christ and he becomes what you pursue, then you find lasting peace. You find contentment, right? How? Well, because all of the security and satisfaction that you actually long for is found in him. So I see people, even believers, who are just clamoring around, looking, scraping, trying to find something that they, they think they need. And that's what they're pursuing. They're going after it. They're chasing it. And Jesus says, no, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So pursue God as your greatest need. When you're anxious, trust God exclusively. Seek God preeminently. And finally, in verse 34, when you're anxious, follow God faithfully as the one who handles what you need. Follow God faithfully as the one who handles what you need. So verse 34, he says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious about for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So he's just mentioned all these things we're anxious about. And we find now that what people were anxious about them was if they were going to be there tomorrow. Am I going to lose my security? Am I going to lose my food? Am I going to lose my, my clothing? Are they going to really be there tomorrow? Jesus says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Jesus doesn't tell us to forget about tomorrow. He tells us to not be anxious about tomorrow. Why? Because, here's the deal, you are not living in the realm of tomorrow. You're living in the realm of today. That's all you have today, this moment, right now. So rather than speculate on what may or may not happen tomorrow, focus on where you are with God today. Because when you follow God today and you're responsible with what he has for you right now, you can be confident he will lead you where you need to be tomorrow. And if there are needs tomorrow, he'll be faithful to be there tomorrow because tomorrow will be today. Tomorrow. When you're there. 
See, God gives the exact grace we need when we need it. If you're facing something today, God's grace is sufficient for today. And if you need God's grace tomorrow, it'll be there tomorrow. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. I think we have time. I was, didn't know if I'd be able to get to this section. But in, in Philippians 4, Paul offers some practical counsel for what do we do when we find ourselves, we find our emotions giving in to anxiety. So I just wanted to take a few moments and, and sort of address from a very practical basis. What can we do in the midst when we find ourselves being anxious? So in verse 6, Paul begins by saying, do not be anxious about anything. He does that because, as we'll see in these verses, God is the source of the provision we need as well as the peace that we need when we're anxious. Paul understands that there will be times when we are going to feel anxious. And so he gives us three things to do when those times come. First, what do you do when you feel anxious? This is practical counsel from God's Word. Number one, guide your heart to pray gratefully. Guide your heart to pray gratefully. Look at what he says, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious. Paul sounds like Jesus here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So rather than respond to needs by being anxious, Paul says we're to respond to needs by going to God in prayer with our request. You see, God is the source of every provision that we will ever need. But I think it's very significant that Paul says when we come before God with our cares, we are to express gratitude to Him. We're to pray with thanksgiving. See, here's what happens. Often, when we go to God in prayer with our anxieties, we tend to just get more worked up over what we're facing because we are praying with anxiety rather than praying with thanksgiving. Let me give you an example. So you're facing something that's really big and you find that your heart is anxious. How many of your prayers have ever sounded like this? Oh God, this is bad. This is really, really bad. You've got to do something. I don't know what's going to happen. Everything is out of control. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, I'm so stressed out, God. I need you to step in. I need you to help me. How many of you have ever prayed like that besides me? Yeah. Hey, listen, that is not prayer rooted in faith. That's prayer rooted in unbelief. Praying with thanksgiving is different. Here's what praying with thanksgiving is. Lord, this thing right now is really, really hard for me. And I don't know what I'm going to do. But I believe you are the Lord. You are the God of all flesh and there's nothing that's too hard for you. So I just want to thank you that what I'm going through has not taken you by surprise. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish in my life through this. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient, that your power is complete. And that your purpose for even this in my life is perfect. So I'm asking you that in this, that you will give me the wisdom to respond to you correctly. And to be able to glorify you in something that's difficult. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to draw closer to you through this. See, that's bringing your requests before the Lord with thanksgiving. It's a prayer that is rooted in faith and that looks to God with confidence. So when you face something that's really intense, a crisis, which you will, by the way, there will be things that will knock your legs out from underneath you. Take a beat. Stop. And your first response is to just go before God with thanksgiving. Acknowledge who He is. Acknowledge you recognize what you need and acknowledge that God is to be praised and glorified and thanked for what he's going to do. What is the result of this? Paul says, well, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, I love this, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Those two realms, the heart and mind, what we think, how we feel, they need to be guarded in times like that, don't they? 
They need to be guarded. So he talks about a peace that can't be manufactured, a peace here that can't be imitated. See, here's what we do. We try to manufacture peace when we're anxious, when we feel anxious. Because what do we don't want? We don't want to feel anxious. Anxious, bad. Peace, good, right? We know that. So we think that the goal is <clears throat> to not be anxious and to be at peace. And so we'll do anything to try to get from that place of anxiety and find that peace. Maybe you've seen the, the t-shirt that says, my doctor told me I'm not to keep my emotions bottled up. That's why I opened the bottle. So a lot of people do that. They'll chase, uh, you know, um, starts out just maybe a glass of wine or two or three, then becomes a bottle or two, and then becomes a daily thing because what am I, what am I after? I just need to chill. I just need to be peace. Um, or maybe they'll turn to yoga or turn to some kind of, of thing to manufacture peace. God is the source of our peace. You can try all the therapies that are available to manage your anxiety, but you'll never experience the kind of peace that surpasses all understanding because this peace only comes from God himself. Notice what this peace does. It guards your hearts and your minds. In other words, God's peace works for you and it works in you. I love this word guard. It's a military term that expresses security and protection. So the peace of God actually stands guard over the inner you, your heart and your mind, as you bring your anxieties to God in prayer. God cares about this stuff. So when you feel anxious, guide your heart to pray gratefully. First, that should be your first response. It should become the default button. Not panic, not run around and clamor after everything that you think is going to help solve your problem in the moment. But to look to God. Second, when you feel anxious, guide your mind to think biblically. Right? The peace of God guards your hearts and your minds. Well, what do you need to think on? Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Eight times here, Paul mentions in this verse things that we are to think about. The phrase Think about is one word. It means to dwell on. It means to consider deeply, to muse over, to ponder again and again and again in the mind. It's a call to lead our minds to be occupied with what is going to lead us away from being anxious. See, the truth is how you think determines what you do. Because thoughts stir emotions and emotions trigger actions. It was A.W. Tozier who said this, what we think about when we're free to think about what we will is what we are or what we will become. And according to 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, we are to take our thoughts into captivity to obedience to Christ. And so now in Philippians 4, 8, Paul lists eight virtues that are occupy our minds. So, so what are we to think deeply about? Well, first, we're to occupy our minds with whatever is true. The word true here refers to what is real, what is certain, as opposed to what is imagined. And isn't that the very place that we go? Oh, this is going to be bad if we do. If, if this happens, then she's going to do this, and then this is going to happen. And we have all these scenarios out in the future that aren't real playing before our minds. So stop. Think about what is real. What are the facts? Here we are. This is real. This has happened. Right? So here's an evaluation question for when you're feeling anxious. Is my mind occupied with what is real or with what is speculative or imagined? Second, Paul says, occupy your mind with whatever is honorable. The word honorable refers to that which is worthy of respect, that which is revered. Here's an evaluation question. When I'm anxious, is my mind occupied with what is honorable or with what is trivial? That's the opposite of honorable. So typically, we, did th we, we make huge mountains out of things that aren't really that big a deal. Third, occupy your mind with whatever is just. 
The word just refers to what is upright, that which is consistent, in other words, with God's standard. This would include things that are consistent with God's character. Evaluation question, when I'm anxious, is my mind occupied with what is righteous or with what is twisted? And that typically happens. We, we obsess over maybe a friend has gossiped about us, lied about us, or we think, oh, my reputation's ruined now, and so we're trying to run de- you know, uh, a counterplay on defense and, and get it all figured out, and we're anxious about that, and oh, I've got to tell Susie about what Jane just did, and, and it becomes a real mess. We're focusing on what is trivial. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Fourth, occupy your mind with whatever is pure, with whatever is pure. The word pure refers to what is clean and upright. It's something that's free from the the presence of evil. It's not tainted with thoughts of covetousness or thoughts of envy or thoughts of revenge or thoughts of selfishness. So here's a question when I'm feeling anxious. Is my mind occupied with what is pure or is it occupied with what is evil? Fifth, occupy your mind with whatever is lovely. The word lovely here speaks of something that's pleasing, something that's attractive. There's a winsome quality about it. It's not marred. It's not grotesque. It's not ugly. So the evaluation question when I'm feeling anxious is, is my mind occupied with, with what is attractive or with what is ugly? Sixth, occupy your mind with what is commendable. Something that is commendable is something that's beneficial because the report about it is good. It's not something that is known for tearing down, but it's known for building up. So an evaluation question is, is my mind occupied with what is helpful or with what is destructive? Seventh, occupy your mind with what has, with what has excellence. The word excellence refers to what is whole or complete. It refers to something that's working as it should. If I took out a, a pocket knife that was dull and it wouldn't cut anything, that is not an excellent knife. But if I pulled out a pocket knife that was razor sharp and that cut that did what it's supposed to do, that's an excellent knife. That's the idea. In a moral sense, it refers to what is right. So here's an evaluation question. Is my mind occupied with what is morally right or with what is morally broken? Finally, He says, occupy your mind with anything that's worthy of praise. Something that's worthy of praise is recognized as something worth praising God for. So these are the things that we see God doing that we're to praise him for. So an evaluation question is, is my mind occupied with what God is doing that is worthy of praise or with things that others are doing that is dishonoring? See, all of these things help me to keep my focus on God. So what is it that fits that grid? What are we to think upon that could be consistent with these things? Well, we ought to dwell on who God is. Dwell on who God is. Because Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Look at those two things. Perfect peace. Mind stayed on you. There's a correlation there, right? Second, dwell on what God does. Dwell on what God does. Psalm 143, 5. The psalmist says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. That's what I'm thinking on. God, what are you doing? So I can thank him, so I can glorify him, so I can praise him. Third, dwell on what God said. Dwell on what God said. So the man who's blessed, according to Psalm 1, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But, notice this, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So think on, dwell on, ponder what God has said. So when you feel anxious, Paul says, guide your heart to pray gratefully, discipline your mind to think biblically. Thirdly, finally, When you feel anxious, guide your life to live obediently. He finally says in verse 9, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So the emphasis in the verse is on the verb practice. When we feel anxious, it's actually a call to action. Remember, Our emotions, anxiety is like a guide. It's 
telling me something about what's going on in my heart. So I'm feeling anxious. And I know I'm feeling anxious because I'm stressed out. I can feel my heart beating faster. My breathing is getting deeper. My stomach is kind of feeling icky. I'm anxious. I'm stressing. I'm sweating. What is this about? Oh, yeah, I remember that lady's seminar. That guy said, stop. Your anxiety is telling you something. My perspective is skewed. Something is off in my life. What do I need to do? Oh, yeah, I remember. I need to take a beat, and I need to seek God, and I need to pray to him with thanksgiving. And I need to think of what God's word says. And I need to live in obedience to his truth. So when we are anxious, it's a call for us to put into practice truth that we have learned. Too often when we're anxious, uh, it's because we're doing the wrong things. We're out of bounds. And, and our emotions are telling us, I feel a little bit awkward here. This isn't right. I'm getting a little bit nervous. And we can either become paralyzed and do nothing. In our anxiety, our thoughts sort of just freeze up. And, we, uh, and we're just toast. I remember, well, I won't go into that story. Um, <laughs> second, we may panic and try to do everything. I mean, we're just, it's like panic. And so we're running around trying to control everybody and everything and make sure everybody knows how we feel. And, and we're talking, you know, a, a mile a minute. We're just, we can't shut up because we go into action and control becomes our default. But Paul gives three ways that we're to guide our lives to live biblically. First, he says, practice what you've learned. Practice what you've learned. The word learn means to come to a place of understanding through instruction. These are the things that you have come to understand as truth has been explained to you. Uh, if you're a Christian, you are a learner. You're a disciple. That's what a disciple is, which assumes you've learned some things in your Christian life. You sit under Bible teaching. Um, some of you listen to teaching online throughout the week. You may even do weekly Bible studies. Uh, Paul's emphasis here isn't on learning more truth. It's on putting into practice the truth that you've already learned. See, there's the deal. You can know the Bible from Genesis to the maps. But if you're not putting it into practice, then your knowledge is in vain. So take what you already know out of the realm of theory and put it into practice in your life when you feel anxious. So put into practice what you've learned through the explanation of biblical truth. Second, Paul says, practice what you've received. Now what you've received here refers to what you've taken to yourself and indicates that there are certain truths that you not only know intellectually, but you own personally. These, these are truths that like you are founded on. These are, the, these are the kinds of verses that you've got tacked up on the mirror in your bathroom. It's the plaque that's over by the refrigerator. This is such a part of your life now that it's your truth. Paul's saying, put it into practice. You own it? Do it. Thirdly, he says, practice what you've heard. He's not saying that we're to put everything we hear from everyone into practice. He's saying, listen, put into practice from those that you've heard who are spiritually responsible for you. That would be your pastor or a biblical counselor or somebody that's a you know, mentor to you. And the things that they have shared with you to help you grow, put it into practice. And then he says, practice what you've seen. And he puts himself up as an example. You're to put into practice the truth that you have seen lived out through others who are taking God by faith. And obeying him. What are they doing? Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I've seen. And what's the result of all this? Well, it's the spiritual stability that comes from the overwhelming peace that the God of peace brings. He says, the God of peace will be with you. And I love this because all throughout the New Testament, five times in fact, the Lord is called the God of peace. And the peace he provides is not just any peace. It is his very own peace. 
So we all get anxious, and I thought dealing with emotions, we just look at one, which is anxiety. And when we're anxious, remember, our emotions are, are telling us something. They're not telling us to follow them. No, they're alerting us to something that there is an issue we need to deal with. Um, maybe your perspective is skewed, and you need to recenter. So hopefully some of these things will help you. And on the back, you can go through some of those diagnostic questions and help you. I think we're going to uh, break here for, um, let's just take seven minutes. I'm looking at this. It says it's 11.10, so by 11, let's make five minutes. 11.15, we'll be back in here for the Q&A. So get a drink, go to the restroom, uh, fellowship. We'll see you back here in a little bit.